taking part in facing with in um something. well it's it, well it's really like connecting ruffles and and everywhere. I think I'm mm. connected guys. Yeah. <laughs> Dear participants, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Diana Russo. I work on innovation and knowledge management for women economic empowerment here at UN Women. And on behalf of the We Empower G7 program and our partners for today's webinar, I would like to welcome you all. Thank you all of you for joining our session on assessing the impact of trade agreements on women's economic empowerment. Today's session is presented by We Empower Program, promoting economic empowerment of women at work through responsible business conduct in G7 countries. The We Empower program is a joint initiative of UN Women, the European Union, and the International Labour Organization established in 2018. This initiative seeks to promote responsible business conduct in G7 countries through multi-stakeholder dialogue and by leveraging the women's empowerment principles, bringing together businesses, leaders, and other stakeholders from various sectors and industries to support the implementation of a G7 roadmap for gender responsive economic uh, environment. The overall objective of a project is to support sustainable, inclusive, and equitable economic growth by promoting women's economic empowerment in the public and private sector in G7 countries, including in the trade sector. Why we speak today about trade? The recent wave of gender responsive trade agreements marks a global shift in the trade policy whereby governments are actively seeking ways to develop and implement inclusive trade agreements. This webinar will explore ways to measure the success of trade agreements on women's economic empowerment by looking at the opportunities for women's exporters and women in the labor market economy. 
Please remember, whenever you would like to ask a question to our panelists, um, just enter it on the question box. We will try to address as many of them as possible. We have an exciting agenda today and an exciting panel with experience in domain we and they will be able to share important uh, theoretical framework and practical uh, tips and tricks as well as recommendation without any further ado i would like to pass it on to the main moderator of this webinar jennifer cook corporate lead women in trade export development canada more about her work and about the topic Jennifer will share in just several seconds. Jennifer, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Diana, for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. As Diana mentioned, uh, we're in an exciting time right now where governments are more actively seeking ways to develop and implement more inclusive trade agreements. Um, and while there's all this positive movement at the moment, there's still many questions about how we're going to measure the success of trade agreements from a gender perspective. How do we understand the impacts of trade agreements on women's economic, economic empowerment? And these are all things that we hope to explore and discuss today in our webinar, with a particular focus on the Canada-European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, CETA. We're also going to talk about a proposed model for measuring and capturing inclusive gender-sensitive data so that we are better able to assess the impact of trade agreements and better inform inclusive trade agreements going forward. In fact, I wanted to mention that We Empower has partnered with the UN Conference on Trade and Development on this topic and have put their findings and recommendations into a report which will be released shortly after this webinar. Okay, so today uh, our conversation, our webinar is going to last 60 minutes. And during the first 30 minutes, we'll feature three 10 minute presentations from our panelists and we'll then open it up for a discussion and Q&A to follow. I will start with an introduction of each of our three guests today, and then we'll pass it to the first to begin with their presentation. So our first panelist today is Leva Anderson, uh, who will present an overview from the EU. Leva is the Policy Officer at the Unit of Trade and Sustainable Development of the Directorate General for External Trade of the European Commission. Through her role as a trade and gender focal point, Leva is working to integrate gender dimensions into EU's trade policy. Our second panelist today will be Stéphane Lambert, who is going to present the overview from Canada. Stéphane is the, is the Councillor and Head of Trade, Economic and Science and Technology Policy at the Mission of Canada to the European Union. In his role, he oversees Canada's trade framework with the European Union and manages Canada's economic and science and technology ties with EU institutions. He has significant experience with Global Affairs Canada in conceiving, implementing and tracking trade promotion strategies. And finally, our third panelist today is Anu Peltola. Measuring the success of trade agreements is what she will present about. Anu will propose a model for measuring and capturing inclusive gender sensitive data to assess the impact of trade agreements and better inform inclusive trade agreements. Anu is a statistician at the Development Stat Statistics and Information Branch of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, where she's developing methodologies and carrying out analytical work related to measuring UN sustainable development goals specifically in the areas of trade and development, technology, finance, and investment. She was recently published in the UNCTAD SDG poll. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Leva, uh, Leva Anderson to begin her presentation. Leva? Uh, you might be on mute because we can't hear you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thank you, uh, you and women, for organizing this uh, very interesting webinar and very topical uh, topical issue on assessing impact of trade agreements on women economic empowerment. Uh, what I'm gonna uh, focus on in the next 10 minutes is I'm gonna uh, give you an insight on how we assess um, uh, impacts on uh, women of EU trade agreements. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give a uh, a short insight on EU trade policy evaluation tools and then specifically focus on sustainability impact assessments and I'm gonna give you then uh, some examples on latest data and information we have on women participation in trade in EU and I will uh, end with um, uh, some uh, some insights on our work uh, with Canada uh, in the context of uh, CETA Joint Committee recommendation on trade and gender. Uh, could we have next slide, please? Uh, and the next one. Yes. So thank you. Um, uh, so in uh, when we look at EU trade policy, we have four main tools uh, to assess the impact. Before we start the negotiations, we do impact assessments, which uh, uh, assesses economic, uh, social and environmental impacts of uh, uh, possible trade agreement. Uh, then, once we start the negotiations, we uh, deepen this analysis into sustainability impact assessments, uh, which will be my focus today. Uh, and these uh, analyses are more in-depth assessments of economic, social and environmental impacts, as well as human rights impacts. Uh, and they are the main purpose is to support the negotiations. Once we conclude, uh, we do an economic an assess, uh, assessment of negotiated outcome uh, in these four tools that uh, stands out as a, uh, not being integrated assessment, but purely focusing on the economic assessment. Then finally, as the uh, once the agreement uh, has been implemented for sufficient uh, uh, amount of time, we do exposed evaluations where we look what has been uh, the actual impact compared to uh, the objectives uh, set uh, set for the trade agreement. And uh, from these tools, uh, impact assessments and exposed evaluations, it's a commission-wide instrument. So whichever policy we talk about, environment, taxation, et cetera, the policy initiatives are supported by these tools. And the two other ones, sustainability impact assessments and economic assessment of negotiated outcome are specific to trade policy. Now, if we go uh, uh, specifically to the recent sustainability impact assessments that we have done, um, uh, if we could have next slide, please. Um, we uh, we have in the three recent ones that we are carrying out uh, for the modernization of association agreement with Chile, as well as agreements with Australia and New Zealand. We have included a dedicated section or chapter on analyzing gender impacts. And we, uh, just to say, we look at both EU impacts in EU and the partner country. And uh, we look at, um, uh, for instance, ratification and implementation of the core UN human rights conventions and at the baseline conditions for the enjoyment of rights which they protect. For example, we look at the uh, um, uh, instruments such as CETA, Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination, as well as ratification and implementation of ILO fundamental conventions, which include uh, Convention 100 on Recall Remuneration and Convention 111 on Discrimination on, uh, in Employment and Occupation, which are particularly le relevant uh, from the gender perspective. Now, uh, what we try to do in this latest um, uh, sustainability impact assessments, we uh, apply UNCTAD's Trade and Gender Toolbox, uh, which is an um, uh, which is a, a tool intended for policymakers to assist to assist in ex ante assessments of impact of trade policy reforms on gender equality. So uh, um, 
just for those who are not so familiar, it includes four main uh, components on descriptive analysis of gender inequalities, such as access to work uh, resources like land or finance or education in the countries involved, then quantitative analysis of expected consequences of the trade reform on uh, the economy and in individual sectors. And here, sectors important for women are identified and matched with the modeling results to determine the scale of potential impacts on women as, as workers. And uh, the third component is identification of other impacts as women as entrepreneurs or consumers and checklist of gender sensitive accompanying measures and monitoring indicators. So uh, this framework of looking at uh, women as workers, women as entrepreneurs, and women as consumers, we try to integrate in our uh, sustainability impact assessments. If we start now with women as workers, if we can turn the next slide, please. Uh, it mainly focuses on, uh, it includes baseline assessments such as uh, employment and wage gaps, uh, analysis of factors negatively influencing women's situation in the labor market, and as well as policy measures addressing inequality. Um, in impacts, we try to look at employment uh, rates and wage gap by sector and skills. Um, as uh, so, and we have already identified a number of challenges when uh, when doing these assessments, such as our computable general equilibrium models uh, have no separate data. For for when and women. So basically, we need to make uh, some good assumptions that uh, impacts would be uh, similar to men and women, which is a clear limitation. And the second limitation is that sectors important for women are not always analyzed separately in the CGE. So that's another limitation. When we look at the women as entrepreneurs and traders, which is the second category, in the toolbox, we try to look at the, to do the descriptive analysis on the share of uh, uh, women-led enterprises per sector. Uh, if you could have next slide, please. Uh, share of exports of women-led enterprises in the economy and per sector, as well as overview of, of policy tools to support women entrepreneurs um, and the measures to support women in their role as traders. Um, in terms of impact, we try to look at sectors showing high share of women-led enterprises in general and sectors imported for women-led exporter, uh, exporters, uh, looking at uh, impact on volume and prices of exports. Uh, here too, uh, we have come across some challenges. Uh, in EU, we don't have regular data collection on women-led enterprises and we see more need for more detailed data outlining, uh, outlining concentration of women-led enterprises within subsectors of agriculture and manufacturing. And we have tried to address that through a dedicated study. I will talk about it in a few minutes. Um, then if we look at uh, women as consumers, that's actually the most challenging uh, category to look at. We try to describe baseline analysis uh, of economic situation of women in the population with a focus on women in vulnerable groups. We try to look at the impacts on income, welfare, and on prices. However, the limitations are the data on which goods are particularly significant for women or for women-led household consumptions is limited. Uh, what we try to do in addition to these analysis to complement by hor hor horizontal dedicated studies, uh, if we can turn the next slide, please. Uh, one of them was done by our chief economist team uh, in cooperation with Joint Research Center and focused on female participation in EU exporting activities, uh, looking at jobs and wages. And from that, we know that 13.5 million in women in EU today have jobs supported by exports of goods and services to the rest of the world. And this has increased from 10 million jobs in 2008. However, only 38% of uh, jobs supported by exports are taken up by women, while their share in overall employment is closer to parity of 46%. Uh, this is important finding because women working in export-oriented 
firms in the EU enjoy a wage premium of 13% on average compared to female workers in total economy. And um, this gender gap in terms of opportunities to benefit from uh, export supported employment is visible across the whole EU, uh, even though in different degrees. If one looks at the proportion of women in export supported jobs compared to overall economy, uh, we can see an interesting picture. This gap is actually biggest in countries like Finland, Denmark and Sweden. This may be uh, surprising knowing how advanced these member states are in terms of policies promoting equal opportunities for women. However, um, it seems that the reason uh, for this gap is uh, structural uh, as women tend to work more in economic sectors, especially services that are not highly traded at the moment at least. Uh, now, if we turn to women uh, entrepreneurs, if we can uh, turn to, yeah, thank you. Um, we have done in cooperation uh, with International Trade Center, a study, a company survey, uh, looking at women participation in trade and the challenges they face. And we found that women are lar largely underrepresented in extra EU trade. Uh, only one in five exporting companies in the EU is led, and by led we mean owned or managed by women. And almost half of companies surveyed, uh, women account for 30% uh, or less of the total workforce. We also found that women-led companies tend to be smaller, both by turnover and uh, employees, and that explains some of the challenges they face. Um, women and men-led companies tend to export and import from similar markets. Here we have China, Russia and US uh, topping the list. Um, however, uh, there are differences in industry co uh, concentration. Women-led companies are most present in clothing subsector, which is uh, uh, a sector with lower growth potential and underrepresented, for example, in transport equipment, which has higher export potential. Um, then uh, finally, when speaking about challenges, uh, as I mentioned, some of them, uh, such as accessing public procurement markets, expanding trade through private standards or dealing with non-tariff measures are clearly linked to the size of the companies women, uh, women lead. However, challenges access, uh, related to access to skills, access to funding from commercial banks and business networks have a gender dimension. They are not only due to size or industry co uh, concentration. Now, uh, to, to finish, I would like to briefly introduce the work that we do together with Canada. Um, we have agreed to cooperate to improve the capacity and conditions for women to access and fully uh, benefit from opportunities created by CETA. And uh, some of the activities, uh, such as sharing methods and procedures for collection of gender disaggregated data and exchanging experience and best practices for conducting gender-based analysis of trade policy are very relevant also for this uh, webinar. And we hope to uh, get interesting uh, discussion later on. We have uh, an active cooperation under this declaration. We have a work plan agreed uh, where we have uh, done joint events as well as uh, exchange of information and best practices uh, through uh, video conferences. We are also one of the issues in the future we are looking how to uh, exchange information on data collection as well as uh, how to assess the impacts of trade agreements like CETA on women's economic empowerment. And I know my colleague uh, Georgina uh, is uh, also listening in, so let's um, uh, let's hope we have some uh, fresh ideas. Well, I thank you for your attention and looking forward to questions and, and debate. Thank you so much, Leva. That was uh, uh, very insightful. Uh, and appreciated. Okay, to our second panelist, uh, I will hand it over now to Stéphane Lambert, who will provide an overview from Canada. Stéphane, over to you. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, and um, hello, every uh, everyone uh, on the call. So, first of all, um, 
before I start, uh, I'd like to uh, really uh, pause and commend the work of UNCTAD and We Empower and UN Women on, on this uh, very timely discussion and the, um, the efforts that they, they put to show top leadership to advance uh, the discussion on assessing the impact of, on trade, of trade policy on, on gender. So in my, um, in my presentation today, um, what I'd like to do, if we can move maybe to the next slide, um, and the, just the one after that. So I'd like to briefly uh, discuss the, the profile and the recent evolution of Canadian women exporters um, to discuss and, and maybe highlight the importance of, of CETA uh, in respect of this profile uh, with the with the hope that this will help calibrate um, how we assess the impact of, of CETA on Canadian women ex exporters uh, more specifically. And uh, then uh, I'd like to discuss kind of the approach to um, to help women entrepreneurs uh, succeed in trade and specifically under CETA, and maybe our early approach to to measure the impact of, of CETA and other FTAs on on women owned um, SMEs. Um, I'll uh, I'll briefly talk about about what we can say to date um, on on CETA, and touch upon the uh, the work that is uh, ongoing, and and finally, uh, I'll discuss uh, the overall government's effort to uh, to help um, women exporters succeed in international markets. So, uh, if we could move to the next slide, I'll I'll start maybe with some of the positive development uh, with respect to Canadian women exporters. Um, this as as significant women in economic empowerment in, in Canada has significantly progressed over the last decade, and, and this is true particularly in trade where we uh, saw some gender gaps uh, closing. Uh, there is still much work to be done, uh, but uh, one of the gap that we saw uh, closing quite quickly is the one in exporters by gender. And this is the, the so-called exporter propensity measure. And this really measures the likelihood that you are going to export if you are, whether a men-owned SMEs or an equally-owned SMEs or women-owned SMEs. So this is, and this is really the ratio of exporting SMEs versus total SME in the same majority gender of ownership. And today we have about um, about 11% of women-owned SMEs um, that export relative to the total number of women-owned SMEs, and this is versus about 11% or 11.7% on average versus 12% for men-owned SMEs. So there is roughly uh, parity uh, with respect to this measure, and this is a big jump from where we were about. Uh, um, uh, about eight, eight years ago when the ratio uh, for women was over half of that of men control SMEs. So uh, w w the, the propensity of, of women-owned SMEs to export has really uh, made uh, significant inroads. If we can move to the next slide, the other positive development is that the proportion of SMEs that are exporting and that are women controlled doubled in just six years. So it went from uh, roughly 7% uh, in 2011 to um, 15% in 2017. Uh, so again, this is, uh, this is really uh, a significant progression, yet there's a long way to go to parity. Um, and and then we're only talking about the number of exporters. If we look at the value of exports, uh, women majority own SMEs, as of, that, uh, as of the general uh, SME population are significantly underrepresented there. So so still a lot of way to go. And there is a persistent entrepreneurial gap uh, with women own SMEs representing less than 16% of all SMEs in Canada. And despite a higher rate of creation of SMEs by women uh, versus uh, co compared to, uh, to, to men uh, and entrepreneurs. Um, so I'd like to, to turn maybe uh, to the, the characteristics of women exporters 
Um, if we can move to the next slide, uh, because there are notable differences by gender, and this is uh, this is important to note in relation to CETA and its significance for Canadian women exporters. The first thing to note is that um, women control exporters um, are making headways into high exporting industries and high exporting industries to the EU. Um, they're uh, they're um, concentrated in information and culture, in, uh, in professional uh, scientific and legal services, and uh, and they made significant progress in the in the past couple of years, and in retail trade. Um, and this is uh, this is uh, these are areas of growth in terms of Canadian exports. The second thing to, to note is that they tend to be smaller than their, uh, their uh, male uh, and uh, equally owned counterparts. Uh, they represent a greater share of exporting micro SMEs and, and of small SMEs overall. But they are solid and they are very, uh, very much export oriented. They, um, in fact, if we, uh, one other measure, um, that I'd, I'd like to point out is the export intensity. And we've seen uh, a significant increase in the export intensity of women-owned companies over the past decade. And in fact, um, the, and this is the, the measure, uh, the percentage of sales that you derive from exports relative to your total sale. And, uh, and in fact, in Canada right now, the export intensity of women-owned exporters is greater than for men-owned exporters. So this means that uh, women-owned companies are more export-oriented, uh, even though they are smaller than their, their, their male counterpart. And the third point to make, and this is very relevant to CETA, is that uh, women-owned um, uh, companies in Canada export in higher rates beyond the U.S. And, and especially into Europe. And, uh, and this is especially true, uh, true for, uh, for companies that are 100% uh, owned. This is very significant. Uh, last year, for example, 37% of 100% women control exporters exported to Europe. And this is compared to only 25% of 100% men control exporters. So again, um, to highlight the importance of CETA to women exporters, first, we can say it covers a market event uh, of, of interest to Canadian uh, women exporters, and maybe of even greater in interest uh, relative to their um, um, male or equally owned counterparts. Um, CETA has a very ambitious outcome with respect to services, labor mobility, procurement, investment. This is beyond just a tariff reduction on goods. And this is particularly relevant considering the profile of Canadian women exporters. And the third thing is the um, Europe being a very large uh, market. It is, if you look at the business side, it is overall an economy of SMEs with significant B2B opportunities in areas uh, where, um, in areas of strength for Canadian women exporters. So it'll be very uh, important and interesting to assess its impact relative to these three points. Um, moving to the next slide. So, as part of its approach to um, trade and gender um, and its overall uh, feminist agenda, Canada has spent considerable time uh, in re recent years investigating barriers or obstacles to trade uh, for women-owned SMEs. There's been a number of you know, roundtables, seminars, surveys, analyzes to, uh, to look into the barriers faced by women-owned SMEs. One thing that we could rule out, uh, and this is shown on the chart there that you see on your on your right, is that education and experience um, of women-owned uh, companies um, in Canada is not really an issue. 
education and um, experience are very uh, important ingredients for exporters. But as you, as you can see on the chart, um, women-owned uh, companies display um, uh, higher education and higher experience or management experience than their male or equally owned counterparts. Um, I'd like to, um, I mean, this is an area where our chief economist office at Global Affairs Canada has done uh, significant uh, work in the past year. And one of the studies uh, that that uh, they found, or they, they compiled many of the studies that Statistics Canada uh, has, has run over the past uh, couple of years. And one thing that consistently comes out is there's a gender pattern in terms of reporting obstacles to trade. And women own SMEs um, in, in Canada report domestic administrative obstacles as an important barrier to exporting at greater rates uh, than men. And, and, and maybe uh, and, and our domestic policies have started to uh, respond and, and to address uh, to these obstacles. But for, tr for um, what, what is where you find the greatest gender discre discrepancy is on foreign obstacles to trade, I mean, obstacles that you find in your foreign markets. Um, and these are reported by women-owned SMEs as a, a significant obstacles at a significantly higher rate uh, than men. And these include border form formalities, compliance issues with the target market, logistical issues. Um, and interestingly, uh, the, the surveys, uh, at least the one that Statistics Canada or a statistical IA agency has run, did not find significant gender difference on other, uh, you know, more typical obstacles to trade like market knowledge, IP, financing, and financial risk. These were flagged as, as obstacles for sure, uh, but but at no uh, greater rate um, or at, uh, at no different rate between women and, and men own uh, companies. So so that would seem to suggest that women-owned companies could be more sensitive to trade policies and to facilitation measures designed to simplify border procedures and customs clearance and, and, and to, uh, to uh, certify their goods uh, for the, the foreign markets. And this is important with respect to CETA because CETA was very much designed uh, to uh, ease uh, trade for SMEs, uh, it has simplified rule, a simplified and modern rules of origins. Uh, you can seek an advanced ruling on origin classification, tariff classification to simplify again your 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 movement, uh, your cross border movements for your your goods. You could uh, assess and certify your goods in your home market to reduce duplication and testing and delays to get your goods in market. So that there are various, various, various tools that are relevant to this conversation. So moving on to, to next slide um, on, on Canada's approach. Um, so I, the, um, the first thing to note is that Canada does not uh, believe that FDAs are gender neutral. Uh, in fact, uh, Canada recognizes that uh, the liberalization of trade and, and FDAs do not produce an equal outcome for men and women. And so um, um, the, uh, it, it is generally employing its effort to work, to make trade work for everyone and to be as inclusive as possible. And this is part of the new trade diversification agenda, which is aimed at addressing some of the concerns that are, are um, I've mentioned, while also generating more economic activity for everyone. And concretely, this agenda translates into changing the way we do trade policies by uh, going forward, subjecting all new FDAs to a gender-based analysis plus, and this is done ex ante at the start 
of any new negotiations and uh, on an ongoing basis uh, to inform each subsequent round of negotiations to support the Canadian participation in these rounds, to support the analysis that we bring to the table and to help identify areas for potential new inclusive trade provisions. This has been done uh, for this has been and is being done currently for the uh, the ongoing negotiations that Canada has with the Mercosur country, uh, and it started since the get-go of the negotiations in March 2018. Uh, and the the and and we have now a, a champion for GBA plus uh, analysis that is located within or at the heart of our trade negotiation branch at Global Affairs Canada. And it's Georgina uh, Wainwright, and she is on the call, and she'll be more than happy to uh, to, to take uh, any uh, any questions uh, with respect to that. Um, the second second element of that agenda is to include as uh, as much as possible with our trade partner a dedicated trade and gender chapter uh, in in new FDAs, and we've done so in the modernized kind of chilling agreement. And in the modernized Canada Israel FTAs. And these chapter really is about an incorporating a gender perspective um, on, on, on trade. Uh, it's about incorporating on the assessment, uh, the impact assessment of the agreement, on, on collecting uh, data that's disaggregated by gender to allow for such an uh, assessment, incorporating on the methodology. Uh, by which uh, we will uh, undertake such an assessment. And it generally provides a framework to undertake trade promotion activities to, to ensure that um, uh, that women-owned um, companies on both sides uh, can really uh, profit and, and benefit from the openings open up by these trade agreements. Um, in CETA, we have a gen, gen, uh, trade and gender recommendation that establishes a similar framework that Leva referred to. And, and I would say FTAs are, are not the only way we can establish such a framework. We have an MOU, for example, with the US and an MOU with Mexico that provides similar kind of, uh, of, of framework. On data and metrics, um, I would say, uh, like uh, as, as Lita has mentioned, that the lack of data and, and, and clear or standard methods has caused some challenge in this respect. And indeed, this is why this is kind of a, a top activity in our trade and gender chapters. And officials are looking to develop tools and, and to work with, uh, with uh, you know, interested countries to look at ways where we could we could collect and collect um, collectively data and conduct analysis and, and assessment in in this respect. And lastly, um, you know, the trade diversification agenda means means most importantly to help more women SMEs reach their full potential and access international markets. And and uh, the government of, of Canada has deployed a whole of government efforts uh, to make sure that uh, we have a very rich ecosystem of support to help women overcome um, gender barriers or gender-related barriers to trade and to succeed ab abroad. Um, in the next slide, uh, you can see here the early impact of the Canada EU CETA. Now, this is the overall impact on merchandise trade that we've seen over the past two years. Um, so as you can see, there's really good results overall on both sides, and this tracks the results over the 23rd month period following the entry into force of CETA compared to the previous uh, comparable period. And we've seen trade up in the double uh, digit number. And this is true across um, most sectors, most top sectors, except perhaps in the in the mining or the extractive side, which is which is um, male dominated, um, and, and across regions. So 
Uh, we don't have, unfortunately, at this time, designated uh, results by gender. It's, uh, it will have to be a work in, in it, it is a work in progress, and, and we hope to, um, uh, that, that soon we'll be able to, uh, to point to such results. We know that uh, it's not charted here, but trade is up by uh, Canadian exports to the EU in services is up by 8% year over year after CETA compared to the previous year. And this is, uh, again, very relevant uh, as services tend to be um, uh, the, uh, the area where we find most uh, women-owned companies. So overall, very strong results um, uh, in, in, in these sectors. Um, so uh, I mentioned that UNCAD thinking and its proposed framework is much welcome. Um, there are challenges, we can discuss this, not the least, and with respect to the, to the CETA, is the fact that uh, the information on tariff reductions and utilization rates comes from the important country, uh, in this case the EU, while the char characteristics on the importer, such as the ownership, comes from the exporting country, and there are matching issues. But um, there are some, uh, and there's well to use creativity and some workarounds and use proxies. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, work is, is really progressing and is underway. Um, the one indicator that I find useful uh, is uh, services offered by Global Affairs. Uh, we track these um, and by gender and we've been doing so over the past two or three years. And we saw a big jump in terms of services provided through our Europe network to Canadian women exporters. In fact, our number of clients, so women-owned companies undertaking market exploration in, in Europe has increased by more than 50%, I would say 60, 70%, I have the numbers in front, in, in front of me, but it's not on your screen. Uh, year over year after after CETA, and the number of successes that we've been tracking, because we've been supporting them, has doubled uh, since uh, since CETA. So this is a big, good proxy of the success of the agreement in reaching um, reaching out to um, women, um, uh, Canadian women exporters. So on the last slide, uh, this really illustrates our whole of government approach. This is a holistic approach. Uh, we're brought under the tent of the Women Empowerment Strategy, the three-year uh, government plan to uh, uh, to you know ensure uh, that uh, women own SMEs can scale up and 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 succeed in international markets. Uh, it's backed up by two billion uh, dollar investment, um, and all of the organizations, so the uh, relevant departments and uh, and agencies, are offering a continuing uh, continuum of support. There's a dedicated uh, resources, dedicated program, dedicated um, uh, support available through the Trade Commissioner Service. Through EDC, with the trade uh, women in trade strategy, maybe Jennifer can say a few words on this. Uh, the BDC also that uh, provides some financing solutions to women as a uh, uh, to women entrepreneurs as a de dedicated support program. There's a there's a network uh, um, to reach out to the community, and of course we work very much with with partners uh, like uh, like. Um, like we empower and like um, you and uh, women. So all stop here, and I look forward to participate in the discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Stefan, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, okay, quickly uh, moving now to Anu to talk to us a little bit about uh, the ideas for measuring success of trade agreements. Over to you, Anu. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm glad to see the many statistics presented by the previous speakers, as I'm a statistician, but I will not share further figures in my presentation. 
Instead, I will talk briefly about how to measure the gender impacts of trade, the data challenges, and how to perhaps overcome some of them. International trade is often criticized for leaving people behind, and more often women, it seems. So we need data to understand the interactions of gender and trade. Even though there is a lot of research, we lack regular comparable statistics on the topic, especially for the analysis of the gender impacts of trade agreements. The policy brief that we have prepared looks at different ways in which trade agreements may impact gender equality. Modern trade agreements, as mentioned by, by Leva and Stefan, tend to include gender equality considerations. Some have a chapter on gender and trade listing concrete measures, but only a few agreements call for the collection of data on the gender impacts of trade, which then still has to be done if there are serious um, goals related to gender equality. So with the next slide, if we look at the global development agenda, the link between the economy and gender came in to the agenda relatively late, trade and gender even later. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development does mention equitable trading systems, but not so much um, about inclusive trade. The Addis Ababa Action Agenda was the first to refer to the link between trade and gender and ask for data in that regard. Existing statistics largely focus on gender equality in employment. Um, some statistics already exist on women's entrepreneurship, but a lot is still left unmeasured. The gender and trade link is also missing from the global gender inequality indices. We recently made a review of the global indices on gender inequalities, and you have a link here to the UNCTAD research paper. For a long time, trade policy was considered gender neutral without specific considerations that relate to gender impacts. But now we know that the impact is transferred through the current structures of economies and the inequalities that already exist, as, as was mentioned previously. So neutral policy was ju would just reinforce these imbalances. It was after the signing of the Buenos Aires Declaration on Trade and Women's Economic Empowerment in late 2017 that the lack of data and statistics for gender responsive trade policy really became the hot potato of debate. Next slide, please. So we heard from the previous presenters about the issues at stake. As the gender and trade interactions are many, UNCTAD carried out a literature review to identify what the main issues are that should be measured. We identified issues such as social and cultural norms, health and motivations. These are factors that influence how people participate in trade. Do they have the possibilities? Available resources or constraints also play a key role. Education, time use, economic rights and so on. Statistics are also needed on the roles of women and men in trade as producers, consumers, workers, business owners, managers. Trade will provide new business and empl employment opportunities that should be measured. It may improve working conditions or make them worse at times of tight competition. Women are often involved in informal work and some jobs are vulnerable to changes in international trade. We should also look at income that trade may bring, new consumption opportunities, economic empowerment, but also the adverse impacts. Also, equal participation in, in trade has been shown in research to contribute to better trade performance for the economy. The underlying thing that we have in the middle here is the trade policy. This is also a factor to be considered it may influence all the other elements and their interact interactions. So therefore, that's also something we should consider when we measure the gender and trade. Then the next slide, please. So, UNCTAD has developed a conceptual framework for measuring gender and trade. 
here we apply it to trade agreements and their assessment. Firstly, assessment needs to consider the economic structures and roles of women and men and the general degree of gender equality in a country. Data are needed on the wide variety of issues as discussed on the previous slide, uh, from determinants of participation to trade to the roles and direct outcomes of trade participation. The impact side on the right is key to assessing possible change brought by trade agreements. In the center and below of the graph, we look at the goals and measures set by the CETA trade agreement. Here we include all the measures that may or may not affect gender equality. Trade agreements may, for instance, include measures to support small and medium-sized enterprises that was mentioned by the previous presenter. Um, it could focus on industries where women entrepreneurs are active and there could be special measures for those industries. A comprehensive assessment should also review whether there are any unintended or adverse impacts from the trade agreements, which we might not know to foresee. So the policy brief provides some more detail about these statistics and lists uh, possible indicators that could be reviewed in the trade agreement context. Next slide then. Speaking as a statistician, I must say that we've already got a lot of relevant data, especially if we think about the EU and Canada that have a high um, statistical capacity. That's why it may be difficult to understand why we don't just have these statistics. Why don't we just disaggregate trade statistics by sex and dis disseminate the results? But it's not so easily done. There is no gender variable in trade statistics. Compiling these types of statistics will require linking of data across statistical domains from social statistics to economic statistics that traditionally live their separate lives. Data are collected using different samples, varying statistical units, businesses, households, individuals, and using different concepts for different purposes. So it will not be easy, at least not in good quality, but we must try and, and develop ways for doing the linking in good quality. Then if we can move to the next slide, please. So how can we move forward? UNCTAD is doing this work together with national and international statisticians and in collaboration with trade policymakers. Some countries are advancing fast. They provide a benchmark and can share methodologies with others. Canada and Finland have already looked at data availability and compiled first indicators, even using microdata on women that are actually employed by businesses that trade. I'm a proud Finn, since we have the youngest prime minister currently, who's also a woman and is working with a government with four party leaders that are also women. However, as Liva mentioned, the new statistics show that Finland has not yet achieved gender equality in international trade. The pay gap is larger in exporting companies, even though they generally pay a better salary. There are rare businesses that are led by women in exports and these businesses employ less women than other companies that do not participate in trade. So there are still things to do. Many of that is structural, but there are also um, some other reasons probably that we can only know about if we have the actual data. It's important to have the accurate statistics to know what the situation is in each country because there are differences. For the data, Canada and EU will need to develop new statistics to monitor progress. There are still many gaps, even though a um, lot has already been done. While we need to start by using existing publicly available statistics, it is important to work with national statistical offices. They have rich data sets that provide 
the basis for better information and they can work together with other authorities that have important relevant information. Sometimes the data is not there, especially for developing countries. Then additional survey questions or ad hoc surveys focusing on gender and trade issues may be extremely useful, especially to assess women entrepreneurs um, and employees' experience and perceptions when they participate in trade. But then I must say that statisticians only compile statistics. We will not make judgments about what is caused by a change in the trade policy or a trade agreement goal. So that will be left for um, other analysts of statistics. It is also essential that statisticians develop new publicly available data, statistics and indicators for such use and also improve microdata access for researchers who can make richer studies looking at these types of relationships. Countries beyond EU and Canada are also interested to develop gender-focused trade statistics. Beyond our work with the European Commission, we will launch projects with Eastern Europe and Africa next year. We would like to thank you and women, the EU Commission and all those who reviewed this brief as it has helped us further a lot the understanding of what should be measured and how it could be done. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anu. Uh, all three very valuable and insightful presentations, so thank you to each of our panelists. Um, we're very close to the end of our time for this webinar, but I did want to try and include a couple of questions just, just briefly uh, before we close off. So um, I'm going to start, Stefan, quickly with you. We've had one question from, uh, from an attendee. Uh, you, you described in your presentation uh, some good indications that certainly Canadian women-owned businesses are benefiting, benefiting um, from CETA in particular, um, but curious on your perspectives of, you know, whether women truly are benefiting from the free trade agreements broadly, and in particular, a question from our, our audience member, what sectors in trade are you particularly seeing Canadian women exporters working in mostly? Hmm. Um, interesting and very vast um, question. Um, I think we're seeing this um, across the board um and the reason i'm saying this and again like without the benefit of data uh but just uh, from the benefit of observations um when i say across the board is uh like that includes even uh non-traditional sectors like agriculture and fisheries and believe it or not uh we like in in brussels uh there is the the, the biggest trade show on fish and seafood in the world, the Global Seafood Expo Show. And last year, we partnered with the organizers to do uh, an event on women in seafood. And it was well attended, and we had uh, a over 40 or 50 Canadian women-owned companies active in the seafood industry that attended this event, and they all came with success stories uh, for the past uh, or the past couple of years and they did uh, link up their recent success to CETA so again like that, that that's uh, just a, a sector I wanted to highlight because it's not necessarily where you would expect to find the most success um, we're seeing it um, in, in, in certainly in, in services trying to see it in procurement um, um, CETA open up vast opportunity for uh, for uh, for exporters in, in services in, in that across the EU. There are over 250,000 procurement authorities in the EU, uh, and uh, the uh, the the trend is going green. Uh, and uh, and I think this is an area where you know, women exporters are competitive as service suppliers to uh, 
government agencies. And when I say government agencies, I mean municipalities, regional, uh, national, and EU level. Um, we're also seeing uh, um, uh, women exporters making inroads in AI, in digital, and of course, especially in Northern Europe, uh, legal and um, uh, legal services, professional services, consultant needs. Um, yes, so across the board. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're, we're, sorry, just just one yep. last sentence on this, because uh, I, I we uh, were holding uh, in January our second. Uh, women focus trade mission uh, to Europe. This one will be, uh, we're uh, organizing it with the support of the Réseau des Femmes d'Affaires du Québec. So it, it's focused on Canadian francophone women uh, exporters uh, and focused on France and Belgium. We did one on Germany and the UK uh, in the fall of 2018. And we brought women exporters from all across sectors, and they really found it very beneficial, and we have nice uh, success uh, stories uh, from 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 these trade missions, and we hope to continue doing this on a regular basis. Excellent. Okay, thank you for adding that, Stefania. Yeah. Um, quickly to Anu, um, you know, you you talked quite at length about the importance of, uh, of data to measure impact and whatnot. I guess a very brief comment from you on, on why do we not have regular statistics on gender and trade? And in your opinion, you know, what efforts are needed? How can we accelerate the progress that needs to happen so that we can uh, uh, better determine ways forward? Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, why don't we have the statistics i think it's a question of awareness so we are at the face of talking to the statisticians letting them know that this is really a pressing trade policy need that data on the gender impacts of trade is something that is really needed across countries in the eu even at the eu policy level and uh, we have been trying to increase the awareness of statisticians that they have relevant data. They are best placed to combine information on gender and social and economic issues, even to trading companies. Um, and I guess we are now at the awareness raising definitional phase. First, first, we need to know what needs to be measured and define what it is. We are almost there. So now next, I think what we can do is discuss these definitions and this data need with statisticians to ensure that they are aware and perhaps could address this issue. What I think those who are assessing the gender impacts now should do is to just try and gather useful data that exists and involve your statistician in your country and try and improve these data. They may be able to tell you what kinds of relevant information sources they have access to that you were not aware of. And then at the same time, they become, become aware of your data needs. Then this is the experimental phase where I think we are now also moving to. Once we develop these methodologies, first with some countries, then we can share and agree on core indicators that we could start producing more regularly by the countries from the different um, areas in Europe and beyond also in our project with the with the African countries. So there's a lot that we need to do. But this Indeed. is basic. Aid. Yeah. Well at least we've at least we've gotten a start, which is really important. I'm going to move uh, lastly to Leva and and Leva ask you to comment, you know, in your presentation you described quite a bit um, you know what you're doing already in the EU. Uh, but that there still remains limits to the analysis and data needs that have been identified. Maybe you can just give us an idea of what's, what's the next step at the EU. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Yes, uh, very happy to do so. 
Um, uh, building on actually uh, what was said before, one of the things that we uh, we realized that uh, in particular ser services sector is particularly important for female employment. So one of the uh, issues that we're planning to do, and we have actually launched a follow-up study uh, similar to the study that we did with um, International Trade Center on Manufacturing and Agriculture, uh, we will look at uh, women participation uh, in services trade and the challenges they face uh, again together with International Trade Center and the results of this study will be available at the end of next year. However, what we realized, I mean, these are these are surveys which are very important to get the first uh, indication of where we are and uh, uh, and what is the situation and what is the main challenges. However, to be uh, effective, we need such data collection on regular basis, uh, which was very clearly outlined by Anu and. Uh, uh, for us, the most efficient way is to integrate such data collection in regular statistics. And um, this is why we have also launched a project together with UNCTAD on uh, better statistics uh, for gender responsive trade policies, where we really want to see, okay, what are the different data sources and how can we match them and how we can, uh, uh, how we can uh, develop maybe a few indicators that would allow us on a uh, regular basis measure the uh, success of uh, trade agreements from the gender perspective. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we certainly look forward to those some some great initiatives and and um, you know I think what will be important as we go forward is how we learn from each other and share information on best practices and and in data collection and analysis um, as you've all commented on today. I wish we had a lot more time. I think this conversation could last another whole hour, if not longer. Uh, it's a very important topic, and I thank you all for your, your input and for being with us today. I'm going to pass it back to Diana to close off as we're, uh, we're much over time today. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, dear participants, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, after all the pre presentations concluded and while we started the Q&A sessions, we also started to receive much more questions, of course, because you were able to actually watch and listen to all the presentations. So while the webinar is concluding in, se like in several minutes, we would um, try to analyze the questions, share with panelists, and maybe we can come up with a written response or with a follow-up webinar. I think Jennifer already alluded to this and it's uh, important to share the experience. Um, I'm certain you will join me to thank uh, all our panelists uh, um, to, for sharing various perspectives on impact of trade agreements on women economic empowerment, specifically on CETA, and of course to our dear moderator for facilitating the discussion and um, highlighting the most important points uh, throughout um, the presentation that made a thread. I would like also to mention that entrepreneurship and trade is a key priority for the We Empower program in Canada. As such, we are excited to release a research paper. And we would like to thank our partner UNCTAD um, for a great collaboration. Please watch out uh, for our announcements on social media, for the resource box on empowerment at work. And uh, we will be happy to um, share many other information regarding to this and of course if needed and if this will be helpful organize another webinar particularly to present the paper or to share additional good practices on this we also would like to acknowledge commitment from government of canada and european union to encourage conversations and actions to advance gender equality through trade this was a wonderful discussion and this is also important for us to understand how much did you learn and your interest to continue the subject. If I may, I would like to launch a quick poll um, in order to understand your interest going forward and how well the information was assimilated. Very quick. 
several seconds. How informed are you after these presentations? I know we received during the registration um, many uh, um, highlights that you don't know where to receive the concrete resources about CETA, um, where to start. So we also compiled um, a list of resources and we will be happy to share in a follow-up email to all the participants together with a recording. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we are very happy that after the session, you are more informed um, with the topic. And of course, um, we would also like to know how satisfied are you with um, presentations, with the way we organized the, the discussion today, but most important, how satisfied are you in regards to understanding the topic and the theoretical framework? Thank you so much for your responses. We do appreciate um your sincere choice um if there is any specific topics related with the trade agreements on CETA please follow up with additional email and we will do our best to respond to the individual or collective request thank you again to our panelists our moderator thank you all for joining until next time <music>